Hello friends. So today I am going to take a very important topic, a very interesting topic and a very dynamic topic which I have get the unbeatable amount of requests to take and that is the fundus pathologies. Now before going into the details of the fundus pathology, let's have a look on the normal fundus. Now when you see the normal fundus, what are the things you have to actually take into notice? First important thing is the optic disc. Optic disc that is always present on the nasal side. So this side is going to be nasal while this side, the other side where you have the macula will be the temporal side. All right. Now what is the diameter of the optic disc? The diameter of the optic disc is 1.5 mm that is called as one disc diameter. It is circular in shape, light pink in color and the diameter is 1.5 mm and from this lies the macula at a distance of roughly we are having the distance of the center of the of the center of the macula to the optic disc margin. Now if you see the distance between this center of the macula and this optic disc margin, this distance is always fixed which is about 2 disc diameter. Now what is the meaning of 2 disc diameter? That means 2 into 1.5 mm and I can say this is 3 mm. Now see this is a very important correlation because whenever you are doing the direct ophthalmoscopy or you are doing the indirect ophthalmoscopy per se it is for direct because there you are concentrating on the central retina. If you see, if you are seeing the optic disc and I want to go on the macular area, I will go 3 mm temporally. Similarly, if you are seeing the macular area and you want to go on the optic disc, come 3 mm nasally. So this is a very important correlation in order to identify. I know that you can identify a macula just by seeing also, but this is especially important for the pathologies where the actual structure of the macula may be hidden or the reflex may not be seen. Now what reflex actually I am talking about? Macula, macula is larger in the size in comparison of the optic disc and the diameter of this macula is 5.5 mm. The diameter of the macula is 5.5 mm and inside this macula lies another area. This area is called as fovea centralis. Fovea centralis is again important having 1.5 mm diameter because this is the area which is most sensitive part of the retina. The sharpest image of the object is formed on the fovea centralis. Now what is the reason? The reason is that it is densely packed with cones. Relatively no rods are actually present in this area and that is why this is the most sensitive part of the retina. Now from where the shining reflex comes from? From the center of this macula and the center of the macula is actually called as foveola. Foveola having a diameter of 0.35 mm and this foveola is actually responsible for giving a shining reflex that is called as foveolar reflex. Now whenever you actually see a healthy macula, whenever you see a healthy macula, a bright shining reflex is always there coming from the center of this macula. So whenever you are getting this reflex, that means you are visualizing a healthy macula. Apart from this, the diameter, the two disc diameter, the distance between the optic disc margin and the foveola, the diameter of the optic disc, then the diameter of the macula, diameter of the fovea centralis and the diameter of the foveola, all these are very important questions, especially for the aims. All right. Now see this another one. Here I have uh, tried to concentrate on the central retina. What is central retina? The optic disc and macula mainly constitutes the central retina. And here you will see, you will get a bright fundal glow. Now whenever I talk about the fundus, we usually talk about the fundal glow. 
what do you mean by this fundal glow fundal glow means the glow that you are getting when you are visualizing the retina due to the fluorescence due to the choreo capillaries which are shining from behind the retina now why we are getting a reddish reflex when you see the retina we get this reddish reflex when you see the retina because of this fundal glow because of the choreo capillaries shining from behind now this means that if anything untoward is present in the vitreous cavity anything present in the vitreous cavity which can hide this choroidal fluorescence which can uh, hide this choroidal reflex from visualization will actually lead to the absence of the fundal glow anything present in the vitreous cavity which is dense enough to visualize this fundal glow will lead to the absence of the fundal glow and therefore it is always a pathological condition so if you are not able to visualize that fundal glow which is a normal thing which is a normal reflex in the retina that is always pathogenic oh, all right now see these are the two important ophthalmoscopes that we are usually visualizing to see the fundus pathology so before moving on to the fundus pathologies let's have a look on the ophthalmoscopes also mainly we have got two ophthalmoscopes direct and the indirect ophthalmoscope now why direct is called as direct and why indirect is called as indirect direct ophthalmoscope is called as direct because you are visualizing directly into the patient's eye with the help of this ophthalmoscope while indirect one we are seeing indirectly now what we are using here we are using the additional lenses mainly plus 20 diopter lens or sometimes plus 13 diopter lenses we are using these lenses and over this lens we are visualizing the eye we are visualizing the pathology over this lens indirectly we are using this headband that will show the light into the patient's eye and image formation takes place on this additional lens on which we are seeing the image therefore this is called as indirect ophthalmoscope now some of the things are worth mentioning here what type of image is formed here and what is the amount of magnification see by the direct ophthalmoscope you are able to see only the two disc diameter area two disc diameter means two into 1.5 that is only 3 mm but by the indirect we see much bigger eight disc diameter by this you are able to see much larger area that is eight disc diameter now the second important thing the image formation the direct ophthalmoscope will make an image virtual erect and magnified remember it by when virtual erect and magnified while in cases of indirect it is rim rim means what it is real it is inverted and it is magnified so you have to be very clear that whenever you are doing the indirect ophthalmoscopy the image that you are seeing is real it is inverted and it is magnified so whenever we draw the diagrams we draw the diagrams while i am visualizing the indirect ophthalmoscopy whatever you are able to see whatever we have plotted here is just the opposite for example if you see a hole in the suprotemporal quadrant if you see a hole in the suprotemporal quadrant it means it is in the opposite side in the infronasal side so it is exactly the opposite all right so here we have real we have inverted and we have magnified now another important thing how much is the magnification the magnification that you get by direct ophthalmoscopy is 15 times while in cases of indirect ophthalmoscopy it is just the five times now this is again very important the area that you are seeing by the direct ophthalmoscopy is much less much less area that is why magnification is much more but the area that is seen by indirect ophthalmoscopy is larger so here magnification is less now because area is more therefore this is better in the hazy media this is better in the hazy media hazy media means it can be a 
lenticular opacity, it can be a corneal opacity, aqueous turbidity, anything that is interrupting the vision. So whenever there is anything interrupting the media, it's always better to do the indirect ophthalmoscopy. All right. Now we come to the first fundus pathology, which is very commonly asked. And in fact, this was asked also in um, NEAT 2018. There was a theoretical question. It was not a visual question, but it can also be asked because this is a frequently asked thing. Now, can you see here, you are seeing the multiple hemorrhages. You are seeing the multiple hemorrhages. Otherwise, everything is normal in the fundus. We can see a good optic disc. We can see the vessels. These are the vessels uh, which are called as the large vessels, which are the central retinal artery and the central retinal vein. Major blood vessels coming from the center of the optic disc. And along with this, we have got hemorrhages. Now, what is so peculiar about these hemorrhages? These are the superficial hemorrhages. And every hemorrhage will show you a central whitish area. Can you see here? We have a central whitish area. This is nothing but a fibrin clot. The central whitish area is actually a fibrin clot. So this is basically a visual of the subacute bacterial endocarditis. Patient is having subacute bacterial endocarditis because what you are able to see here are the roth spots. A very, very important question, roth spots are found in. Roth spots are found in subacute bacterial endocarditis and uh, whenever you are able to see this uh, rod spots, you are always sure that you are dealing with a case of bacterial endocarditis. Whenever a patient is admitted to the side of medicine having the bacterial endocarditis, they will always request a fundus view in order to make it sure whether or not infarction has actually uh, spread it to or extended to the nervous tissue in the form of the retina. So, rod spots, superficial hemorrhages, having a whitish dot in the center, whitish dot in the center is actually the fibrin clot is found in the subacute bacterial endocarditis. All right. Now, see this next one. This is your vitreous hemorrhage. Now, very clearly, you can see a lot of hemorrhage that is lying in the vitreous cavity. And I told you, whenever anything which is abnormal, which is not physiological, is present in the vitreous cavity that can lead to absence of the fundal glow. So you have to remember a very important thing that always in the question, you will get here that there is absence of the fundal glow. Absence of the fundal glow. Absence of the fundal glow is a marker of something untoward in the vitreous cavity and most commonly it is actually the vitreous hemorrhage. Now what type of vision loss? Because whenever you get the visual questions, the theory is also uh, given along with it and you have to actually coordinate the two things in order to reach to the final answer. They will not give you the spot diagnosis. So absence of the fundal glow, one thing that goes in favor of the vitreous hemorrhage. Secondly, the type of the vision loss. The type of vision loss that you get here is the sudden painless, sudden painless loss of vision. As I always say in the classes also that this is actually the most important aspect, how to approach of the question, how to reach to the diagnosis, always see what type of vision loss is actually occurring in this patient. Whether it is sudden, it is gradual, it is painless, it is painful, it is stationary or it is progressive. So if you are getting sudden painless diminution of vision, the idea is more towards the posterior segment. And in posterior segment, if you are having along with the absence of the fundal glow, this goes slightly more in favor of the vitreous hemorrhage. Now quickly we will revise the important causes of the vitreous hemorrhage. What are the important causes of vitreous hemorrhage? The most common cause. The most common cause of the vitreous hemorrhage is actually the spontaneous. Spontaneous vitreous hemorrhage is most common followed by the trauma. Now many a times we get confused the trauma is actually 
the most common cause but you should always know that the spontaneous vitreous hemorrhage is more common in comparison to the trauma. Out of the known causes, the trauma is the most common cause, but if you compare between the two, spontaneous vitreous hemorrhage is much more common in comparison to the trauma. Now, what happens in cases of the recurrent vitreous hemorrhage? Another group of questions that will be asked is the recurrent vitreous hemorrhage. Now, if the vitreous hemorrhage is occurring recurrently, obviously it can't be trauma. So, you have to think about certain pathologies that can lead to the recurrent vitreous hemorrhage. So, what pathology can lead to recurrent vitreous hemorrhage? If it is in the young patient, you have to go with the Eels disease. You have to go with the Eels disease. But if it is an elderly patient, if it is an elderly patient, think about the PDR. What was this PDR? proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So, we have spontaneous, we have trauma, we have Eels disease and we have proliferative diabetic retinopathy. These are the four important things that should come into your mind whenever you are dealing with a case of the vitreous hemorrhage. All right. Now, coming to the next important thing and see this one. Now, what can you see here? I can see a pale retina, uh, the glow that I was talking to you about, that glow is actually absent here, can you see? It's a very pale retina and along with this, a central area which is uh, very bright in comparison to whole of the retina that is seen. So, what will be the diagnosis? This is very clear cut, a case of the cherry red spot cherry red spot a cherry red spot is actually formed due to the contrast one between the bright area and another is your pale retina whole of the retina is pale only one area continues to shine continues to look red and that is your cherry red spot now where you get this cherry red spot we get this in c r a o CRAO is very important, it's an ophthalmic emergency and one of the important diagnostic feature of this CRAO is the cherry red spot. Now three things always remember, three things are most important in cases of this CRAO. First of all, you get this cherry red spot. Second thing, why you get this cherry red spot? It is not due to the blood accumulation, it is not the pigment accumulation, rather it is the only normal area where the choroid continues to shine through the fovea centralis. Yes, the choroid continues to shine through the fovea centralis while rest of the retina has become pale. Now, why it was pale? Due to exudation because of the collection of exudates in which layer? The ganglionic cell layer. Exudates are collected in the ganglionic cell layer and ganglionic cell layer is not present in the fovea centralis. That is why from this layer the choroid continues to shine looking red in color while rest of the retina has become pale and this has led to a very important sign called as cherry red spot. Now, the DD of this cherry red spot. Again, the DD of cherry red spot is very, very important. Let us see the DD. Always remember, it is the cherry trees. Cherry trees never grows tall in the sand and the mud. The cherry trees never grows tall in the sand and mud. Now, what is the meaning of this? C stands for CRO, T. T stands for the Tay-Sachs disease, N. N stands for the Neiman Pick disease, Neiman Pick disease, then G. G stands for the gangliosidosis, gangliosidosis and also the Gaucher's disease. It also stands for the Gaucher's disease, then T. T is actually the trauma, which trauma? The blunt trauma and blunt trauma shows the Berlin's edema, the macular edema or the Berlin's edema. Then we come to the sand, sand is actually the Sandhoff 
disease, son of disease, and then we have the mud that is the metachromatic. It is the metachromatic leukodystrophy. A very simple way of learning the causes of the cherry red spot and I must say that they are worth it because many a times you are being asked the DD of the cherry red spot or the questions which actually requires a knowledge of the DDs of this cherry red spot. CRO very important, Tay-Sachs disease, Neyman pick disease, gangliocytosis, blunt trauma. Uh, in the blunt trauma, we were having this Berlin edema. Then we were having this S. S is your send off disease. And then we have M that is metachromatic leukodystrophy. Now, you must be thinking what about this Gaucher's disease because many books say that it shows but and many books also say that it is not found here. The reason is that here you get a pseudo. Here we get the pseudo cherry red spot. Why we get a pseudo cherry red spot here? We get this pseudo cherry red spot means there is a reddish spot which is found in the Gaucher's disease but it is not the same reason. It is not the true cherry red spot that we are getting in all other conditions. Now why we know this, uh, knowing this is important. Knowing this is important because sometimes you will have to consider Gaucher's disease as a cause of cherry red spot and sometimes you will have to exclude. For example, I'll give you one example. Suppose they say cherry red spot is found in all except and the options which they give is CRAO, Tay-Sachs disease, Neyman pick disease and the Gaucher's disease. So obviously your answer will be the Gaucher's disease here. This will become the answer that it is not found in the Gaucher's because it is a pseudo cherry red spot. But if I change the option in the same question, suppose I change the option and I say cherry red spot is found in all except and I say it is CRAO, then in Tay-Sachs disease, then in Gaucher's disease and if I give CRVO, now what about this? Now you will say that the answer will be CRVO because still Gaucher's shows a pseudo cherry red spot. No red spot is found in CRVO. So you will have to individualize the cases. You will have to take your decision. Keep it as an extra member of the cricket team and choose the Gaucher's disease intelligently according to the other options. So very important is the cherry red spot. Now coming to yet another important fundus pathology. Can you see lot of blood in present inside the fundus here? It is wholly filled with the blood. This is the typical, typical sp splashed tomato appearance. This is the typical splash tomato appearance. And where you get this splash tomato appearance? In the CRVO. Which type of CRVO? In the ischemic type of ischemic type of CRVO, what happens in the ischemic type of CRVO? Because it is of ischemic type, lot of ischemia is there. Now, what will happen if there is lot of ischemia? Lot of vascular endothelial growth factor is released. Now, what it is causing? It will cause the angiogenesis. Now, what will happen due to angiogenesis? There will be lot of neovascularization. And when there is lot of neovascularization, there will be lot of hemorrhages. And this is the reason why this is also a cause of 100-day glaucoma. It is also a cause of 100-day glaucoma. Yet another important question that was also asked in the NEET 2018, 100-day glaucoma is found in. So this is the typical splashed tomato appearance while we get the cherry red spot in the CRAO. We get this splashed tomato appearance in cases of CRVO. This is also called as blood thunder appearance. It is also called as the tomato ketchup appearance. The idea is lot of hemorrhages in the fundus. So if you are getting lot of hemorrhages in the fundus, you are always sure that you are dealing with a case of CRVO. All right, now coming to the another one, another important fundus pathology. Can you see this? This fundus is very neat and tidy. Can you see very few things are visible here? We don't have lot of hemorrhages. We don't have lot of exudates here, but you can see three things. Now try to appreciate three important things here. 
first of all we have thinning of the vessels which is actually called as the angiospasm and as I always teach you in the classes that angiospasm is the key feature of it is the key word of which retinopathy yes you are right the hypertension retinopathy it is actually a key feature of the hypertension retinopathy so we are getting here now we also know that what type of hemorrhages and what type of exudates you should get in hypertension retinopathy yes so we should get the flame shaped hemorrhages and we should get the soft exudates soft exudates in the hypertension retinopathy which are also called as the cotton wool spots they are also called as the cotton wool spots now let us check here do we get flame shaped hemorrhages and the cotton wool spots here look at the shape of the hemorrhages yes they are actually flame shaped hemorrhages why they are flame shaped because they are actually the superficial hemorrhages because these hemorrhages are superficial they take the shape of a flame they take the shape of a flame so they are called as the flame shaped hemorrhages while these exudates are large fluffy laudaceous can you see these large fluffy exudates are called as the cotton wool spots or the soft exudates which are actually the neuronal debris this is the neuronal debris and why we get this neuronal debris due to the retinal hypoxia due to the retinal hypoxia so what is happening due to the retinal hypoxia we are actually getting the exostasis there is a stasis in the flow of exoplasma due to which the accumulations of the neuronal deposits take place in the superficial layers now what these superficial areas a fiber layer believe me every single word that i have written on this page is a mcq angiospasm superficial hemorrhages soft exudates wool spots they are neuronal debris they are found in a fiber layer they are occurring due to retinal hypoxia which is leading to exostasis along with the visual recently the uh, visuals of asked both of them uh, were asked in the jipma 2019 every year you are getting the visuals and let me tell you out of all the visuals of fundus pathology are uh, again a important topic and out of the fundus pathology diabetes and hypertension remains the main prerogative so you have to remember what is the main hallmark of the hypertension retinopathy what are the two important features of hypertension retinopathy why they are found in which layer they are found and how to recognize them in the visual all these things are actually important all right now coming to the next one now in order to see the staging of the hypertension retinopathy in order to see the staging of this hypertension retinopathy it is important that we should know what are the characteristics of the normal fundus if you see the normal fundus you will have three things first is the uniform caliber see the caliber of the vessels the caliber of the vessels should be a uh, very smooth there should be no beading there should be no looping there should not be any tortuosity it should be very very uniform plus the caliber means the space that should also be uniform like you should not have kinking at some places or dilatation at some places so there should be uniformity it should be smooth and the branching that is taking place branching is should be present at the obtuse angles otherwise that will also show a pathology now in order to see the real pathology that is found in the different stages of the hypertension retinopathy you have to recognize another important thing and that is called as the av crossing this is called as the av crossing what do you mean by av crossing av crossing means where a vein crosses a artery where a vein crosses a artery now this darker one is a vein and the lighter one is a artery here also this is a vein and this is a artery here this is a vein and this is a artery so whenever a vein crosses a artery that is actually called as av crossing a artery can cross a vein or a vein can cross the artery there is no problem in that 
Now, what are the signs that you get at this? Now, see, this is the first sign called as the salute sign. Salute sign, see what it is. Salute sign say that it is actually the deflection in the course of the wind at the AV crossing. It is just at the AV crossing. I told you what is the AV crossing where an artery and a vein cross each other. Now, if you see this, what is happening here? Can you see this one? This darker one is a vein here. This is a vein here. And this lighter one, this is a artery here. So this will become a AV crossing. This will become a AV crossing. And this is actually the deflection of the veins. So whenever there is a deflection of the vein at the arteriovenous crossing, this sign is called as the salute sign. This sign is called as the salute sign, which is actually found in the stage 2 hypertension retinopathy. Now, you may see that sometimes it is also written in stage 3. Now, the patient may show this in stage 3 also, but the earliest stage where it can be seen. The earliest stage where it can be seen is actually the stage 2 hypertension retinopathy. All right. Now, coming to the next one. If you see the next sign that you get in cases of the hypertension retinopathy, this is actually called as the bonnet sign. This is called as a bonnet sign. Now, what is the bonnet sign? Let us see this. This is banking of the vein distal to the AV crossing. So, here what is important is the distal. There it was at the AV crossing. Here we have distal to the AV crossing. Now, let us see here. This darker one is a vein and this lighter one is a artery. And this is the deflection of the vein that you are getting distal to the AV crossing. That is why it is called as a bonnet sign. So you are clear with the salute sign that was found in the stage 2 hypertension retinopathy. This is bonnet sign which is found in the stage 3 of the hypertension retinopathy. Now coming to the next one. The third important sign is actually the gun sign. Now, what is this gun sign? Concealment of the vein. It is the hiding of the vein beneath the artery. When a vein is hidden beneath the artery at the AV crossing, means just at the AV crossing, just where the artery is crossing a vein, if the vein is hiding beneath the artery, that is actually called as gun sign. Now, see here. Can you see here? Here we have a vein and we have an artery. This is also a vein and an artery. Now this is the vein that is hiding. Can you see? This is the vein that is hiding. So a vein is hiding beneath the artery just at the AV crossing. So this sign is called as the gun sign. So I hope it's very clear. The hypertension retinopathy along with what is arteriovenous crossing, what are the different stages and how you get the salute sign, the, the distal one that is bonnet sign and how you get the gun sign. All right. Now coming to the next one. If you see the next one, a very important retinopathy. This is actually the diabetic retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy. Now, whether it is NPDR or whether it is a PDR, how will you differentiate? Now, start looking at the pathologies. Can you see very small the pinpoint hemorrhages? These are actually the pinpoint hemorrhages. The pinpoint hemorrhages which are found in the diabetic retinopathy are actually the microaneurysms. These are the microaneurysms which is the earliest feature earliest feature of the diabetic retinopathy. Now, because this is the earliest feature of the diabetic retinopathy, therefore, I can say that this is the earliest feature of NPDR also. NPDR means the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. NPDR is always earliest stage of diabetic retinopathy and in NPDR the earliest phase is the microaneurysm. So I can say that this microaneurysms is the earliest feature of NPDR also and of the diabetic retinopathy as a whole also. Now what are the other things that we are getting? We are getting the other uh, sizes of the hemorrhages like we are having the small dots. These are called as the dots. And larger than this are actually the blots. These are also the blots. So we have the pinpoint hemorrhages also. We have dots also. We have blots also. 
Now you have to always remember that D for diabetes, D for dots and also we have D for the deep hemorrhages. Here we are getting actually D for the deep hemorrhages while we were getting the superficial hemorrhages in cases of the hypertension retinopathy we get deep hemorrhages in cases of the diabetic retinopathy. Now what are the other things? You can also see the hemorrhage the hemorrhages along with the yellowish collection of the exudates. So this is actually what you called as the hard exudates. These are the hard exudates. Can you see the difference between these hard exudates and the soft exudates that were actually visible in the hypertension retinopathy? They were large, they were fluffy, they were laudaceous cotton wool spots. Now these are small, they are pale, yellow, waxy. And they are present in the deeper layers. Sometimes they are also arranged in a ring shaped fashion. If they are arranged in this ring shaped fashion, then this is actually called as the sarcinate. This is also called as sarcinate retinopathy. It is also called as the sarcinate retinopathy. Now you have to be very peculiar about the layers in which they are present like the changes of the hypertension retinopathy were present in the nerve fiber layer, the changes of the diabetic retinopathy. If I talk about these hard exudates, they are present in the outer plexiform. So you can remember it by hop. Hard exudates are present in the outer plexiform layer. Now what about the other two layers? Microaneurysms and these deep hemorrhages, both are present in the inner nuclear layer. Now, if you remember, I always ask you to remember one important thing and that is the open. That is the open. Means these two layers always opens the gate for retinal diseases. These two layers always opens the gate for the retinal diseases. Which two layers? OP that is your outer plexiform. This one is outer plexiform and then we have IN. IN means inner nuclear. These two layers always opens the gate for the retinal diseases. So here also we are having these two important layers. Now HOP means outer plexiform is for the hard exudate. So you are left with IN. So the other two things that is the microaneurysms and the dot and blot hemorrhages, they are actually present in the inner nuclear layer. So I can say that we have hemorrhages, we have exudates, we have pinpoint hemorrhages, we have microaneurysms, we have dots, we have blots. But there is no proliferation, there is no neovascularization. That is why I can say that this is NPDR stage of the diabetic retinopathy because there is no evidence of the proliferation. All right. Now here we have another visual which will show you certain changes of the NPDR only. Can you see, just to show you clear cut what I was talking about, I have tried to uh, label them. Like this was your optic disc and these are the micro aneurysms, just the pinpoint hemorrhages. Can you see, this lighter one is artery, darker one is the venule, yes. And then we have hemorrhages here and then we have the exudates. So these are the different features that you get in a case of the NPDR. Now see the another thing which we can get in cases of NPDR. In the visuals of the NPDR, what are the other things that we can get? We can get IRMA. What is this IRMA? This is the AV shunt. This is the shunt but it is not found in the major blood vessel. They are found in the small branches. The small branches that are actually coming from the major blood vessel. This is a major blood vessel. These are the small branches here. Now whenever the small branches which are actually coming out from the major blood vessels, they are showing you shunting, arteriovenous shunting. That is actually called as IRMA, a area of intraretinal microvascular abnormality, intraretinal microvascular abnormality, intraretinal means inside the retina, microvascular means affecting the smaller blood vessels abnormality that is showing you the shunting. So don't confuse it with the neovascularization, it is just the intraretinal microvascular abnormality 
which is also an important feature of NPDR. And if you are having this IRMA even in one quadrant, if you are having this IRMA even in one quadrant, I will say it is a severe NPDR. Similarly, another important thing is the venous bearing. If you are getting the beaded structure in the vein, this is again a important criteria for the severe NPDR. IRMA at least in one quadrant. Even in one quadrant of IRMA says that it is a severe NPDR. Venous beading. This should be present in two quadrants. If venous beading is present in two quadrants, then I will say that this is a severe NPDR. And if you are getting the microaneurysms in all the four quadrants, if you are getting the microorganism, uh, microaneurysm, sorry, in all the four quadrants, then I will say that this is a severe NPDR. And together, this is called as 4 2 1 rule. Together, it is called as 4 2 1 rule. Now, what is this 4 2 1? 4 is for the microaneurysms. If the microaneurysms are present in all the four quadrants, then number 2 is the venous beading present in at least two quadrants. And then third is the one that is Irma. It should be present even only in one quadrant will lead to the criteria of the severe NPDR. All right. Now, this is another visual which is showing you the same things. The Irma is seen here. And then we have also the beading inside the vein. Again, it is a severe NPDR. So, I can say it is a severe NPDR. Now, you will say why I want to say that it is a severe NPDR or it is non-serious because I want to decide about the anti-VEGF agents. It is important because we have to decide when to give this anti-VEGF agents. We do give this in cases of the PDR but we can also give this in cases of severe NPDR. Whenever the person is showing you severe NPDR, don't wait for the PDR to occur. We can just start the NTVEGF agents. Now, this is another visual showing you a very beautiful venous looping. Can you see the H-shaped loop? This is the venous looping shown in the visual. So, this is again a case of the severe NPDR. Now, what is actually PDR? PDR, the proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which was the most common cause of the neovascular glaucoma. It was the most common cause of the neovascular glaucoma. It was also the most common cause of the recurrent, of the recurrent vitreous hemorrhage in the elderly patient. Now, why? We are saying that it is the most common cause of neovascular glaucoma also. It is the most common cause of recurrent vitreous hemorrhage in the elderly. The idea is I want to show you how much of proliferation takes place here, how much of ischemia takes place here. Now, why we are getting so much of ischemia here? We are getting so much of ischemia because you have lot of what you called as the microangiopathy. It is actually a microangiopathy because it is mainly affecting the smaller blood vessels and that is the reason why it is actually causing lot of neovascularization, lot of recurrent vitreous hemorrhage. Now, what kind of neovascularization you are having? We have NVD that is neovascularization at the optic disc. We have neovascularization at the optic disc and then we also have the neovascularization elsewhere. This is called as NVE. This is found along the major blood vessel. Can you see? Now, this is the main difference between the NVE and the IRMA. IRMA was not found in the major blood vessels. It was found in the small branches coming from the major blood vessels while the NVE is along the major blood vessel. So, we have clear cut two cases. We have the NVD and we have NVE which can actually differentiate this PDR from the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Now, see here. Can you see the difference here? We can have a comparison between the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy and a proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Now, if you see, what are the main differences? In NPDR also, we have aneurysms, we have hemorrhages, and we have exudates. 
Now, similar things you are finding here also. We have hemorrhages, we have exudates. But what is the difference? Difference is the neovascularization. The difference is the proliferation of the new blood vessels because you are getting abnormal blood vessels here because you are getting a lot of proliferation at the optic disc that is NVD. That is why I can say that this is actually the proliferative stage of diabetic retinopathy called as the PDR. So this is how you can actually differentiate the hypertension retinopathy, the diabetic retinopathy and within the diabetic retinopathy also where you have NPDR and where you have PDR. All right. Now continued with the fundus pathologies, our uh, next important pathology is the retinopathy of prematurity. Now where I am saying that retinopathy is of prematurity, I mean basically the infants who are less than 32 weeks period of gestation according to the original definition, but now it is less than 28 weeks period of gestation which is actually the period of viability and second is the weight weight less than 1.5 kg. If the weight is less than 1.5 kg, according to the newer criteria, it is less than 1.7 kg. So we can go with the original criteria as well as the new guidelines, less than 32 weeks, period of gestation, or according to the new guidelines, less than 28 weeks, period of gestation. Then second is the weight. Originally it was less than 1.5 and now it is less than 1.7 if they are exposed to the high concentration of oxygen. When all these babies are kept in incubator and they are exposed to high concentration of oxygen, there can be a lot of things that can happen inside the retina. Now these things are actually categorized into certain stages if you see the stage 1. If you see the stage 1, stage 1 is actually the demarcation line. Demarcation line means there is a demarcating line between the avascular retina and second is your vascular retina because whenever this immature retinal vasculature which is present in the premature infants are exposed to high concentration of oxygen lot of vascularization, lot of proliferation actually takes place and the first important thing that takes place is a demarcation line between the two. Now what happens in the stage 2? Stage 2 means it is becoming now a ridge. Earlier it was just a demarcation line, now it is becoming a ridge. Ridge means the elevation of this demarcation line plus the broadening of this demarcation line it becomes elevated, it becomes broad, this is called as a ridge. Now after this, in the third stage, there starts the extra retinal fibrovascular proliferation. So over this ridge starts the proliferation and due to this immense proliferation, there can be detachment of the retina. There can be detachment of the retina, now retina can be detached. Now this retinal detachment can be subtotal or it can be total. Here they have shown the total retinal detachment. But initially this can be subtotal and after some time it will lead to the total retinal detachment. So I can say that there are actually five stages of the ROP starting with the demarcation line. Then second is the ridge. Then third is a ridge with vascularization. And then we have the fourth and fifth subtotal RD and the total RD. Now with respect to this retinopathy of prematurity, we also have certain zones. The zones are the zone 1, zone 2 and zone 3. Can you see zone 1 is concentric while zone 2, zone 2 is towards the optic nerve. So this is towards the nasal side and then we have a temporal crescent here. This is called as the temporal crescent which is present in the zone 3. Now how to decide the diameters? For this if you see this, we have got 3 zones here, the zone 1, 2 and 3. Zone 1 is actually twice the radius from the optic disc to the fovea. Now if you remember I already told you 
the diameter between the optic disc and the fovea that is macular involvement was two disc diameter. Here they are taking twice that. So this is now four disc diameter and that will define your zone one, right? Then coming to the zone two. In the zone two, it is a nasal involvement to the temporal equator. So I told you that it is going nasally and whatever is remaining on the temporal side, this crescentic area which is remaining on the temporal side, this will be included in your zone 3. So the residual crescent which is anterior to this zone 2 is actually your zone 3. So we have zone 1, zone 2 and zone 3 for the involvement that will show the severity also whether it is closest to the optic disc or it is away. Alright, now see here. Another important thing with respect to the retinopathy of prematurity is actually the extent. Another important thing is the extent of involvement. This extent of involvement lies with respect to both the eyes. We have got the both the eyes and how much is the involvement that extent is actually shown in the claw cards. So one were the stages. Then one were the zones and now we have got the extent of involvement that I can show in the form of clock hours. Like we have got this uh, as 12 o'clock, then 6 o'clock, 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock. This will be your left eye and similarly in the right eye also we have 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock. So I can say the stage, then zone and then the extent. According to this, I will say whether it is a threshold disease or it's a pre-threshold disease, it's a plus disease, what is the severity, what time to do screening and what will be the treatment. All right. Now coming to next important <coughs> pathology and that is the retinitis pigmentosa. Retinitis pigmentosa. Now if you see the name of this pathology, it is retinitis pigmentosa. Retinitis pigmentosa means that it is affecting the pigmentary layer of the retina that is RPE layer. It is also the most common hereditary dystrophy. It is also the most common hereditary dystrophy. It's a hereditary disease, it's a pigmentary disease and it's a degenerative disease. That means it's a dystrophy. Most common hereditary pigmentary dystrophy which is affecting the photoreceptors. Now because this condition is affecting the photoreceptors, that means both rods and cones will be affected and rods are affected much more than the cones. Rods are affected much more than the cones. Periphery is affected earlier in comparison to the center. Plus it is a pigmentosa. Now based on this, you will get one important thing and that is the bony spicules. Can you see here? These are the spicules. Bony spicules or the pigmentary spicules which are present in all of the periphery of the retina and that is why this kind of a patient will actually have the ring scotoma. Another important question, ring scotoma is found in. Ring scotoma is actually found in a patient of retinitis pigmentosa where whole of the periphery is affected by the pigmentary spicules or the bony spicules and a stage will come when whole of the rods are affected, cones are not affected and the patient will continue to have central vision tunnel vision or the tubular vision and finally <coughs> when cones are also affected this central vision will also go. Now what is the next important thing? The disc. We also get the pale yellow waxy optic disc. Pale yellow waxy optic disc and the third important thing is the vessel attenuation. So the typical triad of the retinitis pigmentosa that will help you in making the diagnosis is your bony spicules, the pigmentary spicules, then pale yellow waxy optic disc and the attenuation of the vessels. If you see a earlier stage of retinitis pigmentosa, can you see this? 
we have got the constraint triad here. We have got the pale yellow waxy optic disc. We have got thinning of the blood vessel, vascular attenuation along with the retinal pigmentation. Though the triad is present here, but this is a very uh, beginning stage, initiating stage because the spicules are not dense enough here to cause the ring shaped scotoma. All right. Now, seeing the next important thing which looks very similar to the retinitis pigmentosa and this is actually what you call as salt and pepper retinitis. Salt and pepper retinitis, many times it is very close to the RP and the people get confused because one of the DDs of the salt and pepper retinitis is also the retinitis pigmentosa. See, here you are also getting the pigmentation, here also you are getting the patches, but there will be no triad, no vessel attenuation, no pale yellow waxy optic disc is there. Then what are the different causes of this salt and pepper retinitis because it is again an important DD. Here we have got the congenital rubella which is the most common as well as most important DD of the salt and pepper retinitis that is congenital rubella. Then we also have <coughs> the congenital syphilis, congenital rubella, congenital syphilis, then one was retinitis pigmentosa. Then also the Leber's disease, that is the Leber's amyrosis. Then what else? We are also getting as the drug toxicity, like we are getting this in the thioridazine. In the thioridazine toxicity also, we are getting this salt and pepper retinitis. We have um, congenital rubella, I can say, is the most important one. Then apart from this, we have syphilis, we have Leber's amyrosis. We have the thioridazine toxicity. Then we also have the maculo cerebro, maculo cerebro facial degeneration. Facial degeneration, this is another important cause of the salt and pepper retinitis. Then we have got the fundus, fundus flavi maculatus, fundus flavi maculatus. This fundus flavi maculatus is actually the stagger disease. If you remember in the uh, previous video, I told you about the best disease as well as the stagger disease, the two important macular dystrophies. So this fundus flavi maculatus, which is a part of the stagger disease only, is again coming under the DD of salt and pepper retinitis coming under the DD of salt and pepper retinitis all right now coming to the next important thing this is a visual showing you the enjoyed streaks enjoyed streaks now this is again a DD of retinal diseases where a number of conditions can cause this enjoyed streak this is actually the breaks in the breaks you are getting in the Brooks membrane of the choroid. Breaks in the Brooks membrane of the choroid. These breaks are actually due to the degeneration and they look like the, the irregular lines. They are looking just like lines if you see here. They are just very fine lines that you are getting on the fundus and these lines are actually visible due to the breaks which is in the basal lamina of the choroid. Basal lamina means the Brooks membrane. Now what can be the causes of this enjoyed streak? The causes of the enjoyed streak, you can remember it by the Pepsi. Always remember the Pepsi. Now what are the important causes? The first important cause is the P that is your pseudoxanthoma. This is the pseudoxanthoma elasticum. Pseudoxanthoma elasticum is the most common cause or the most common DD. Then we have E. E stands for the Ehler-Denlos syndrome. Ehler-Denlos syndrome. Then we have the P. 
P is the Paget's disease here. This is the Paget's disease. And finally, we have SI. This is your sickle cell, sickle cell retinopathy. Sickle cell retinopathy. So, we have pseudosynthoma elasticum, we have Ehlerdin Law syndrome, we have Paget's disease, and we have sickle cell retinopathy. Again, a very important question as far as visual is concerned as well as the DD is concerned. Okay. Now, coming to the next one. Now, can you see the small lesions which are found in all over the fundus? These are actually the drusens. Drusens is the characteristic feature of dry ARMD. Dry ARMD, which is also called as the geographic, which is also called as the geographic ARMD. And drusens are what? These are actually the colloidal deposits. These are the colloidal deposits which are present between the two layers that is retinal pigment epithelium and the Brooks membrane of the choroid. Brooks membrane of the choroid because retinal pigment epithelium is the outer layer of the retina and the Brooks membrane, this is the basal layer of the choroid, they are always in close contact with each other. Now, whenever we have the colloidal deposits which are present in between these two layers, these are actually called as drusens and they are the characteristic or they are the hallmark, characteristic or the hallmark of the dry ARMD which is also called as the geographical ARMD. Now, coming to another important thing. This is called as the bullseye, this is called as the bullseye retinopathy. Bullseye retinopathy, in the bullseye retinopathy what you are having a dark area in the center. Can you see a dark hyperpigmented area that you are getting in the center. Then we get a zone of hypopigmented area. And then again we are getting a zone of the hyperpigmented area. So we have hyper, then we have hypo and then again we have hyper. That is why this is called as bullseye retinopathy and a very important MCQ which drug is causing that is the chloroquine. It is the chloroquine which is responsible for causing this typical bullseye retinopathy that is your hydroxychloroquine or the chloroquine.